Hello, I'm Joe Schubeck, and I'd like to share some memories with you. My first memory is how easy I got in and out of this car back in 1965. Drag racing became my burning desire the day I began reading Hot Rod magazines about this new trend that started in Southern California. In Cleveland, with snow-covered streets, I read and reread the stories by Hot Rod editor Wally Parks, describing the upcoming superstars and their quest for more power and lighter cars. But it wasn't the coops or roadsters that got my attention. It was the all-out rail jobs, as they were called. My big wish was to someday compete against those I read about, not only in California, but throughout the country. At the time, I couldn't see how or when I would achieve my dream, but I had a strong belief that I would. Well, as the saying goes, be careful what you wish for. One Sunday, my mother, a real churchgoer, she said to me, someone just put up a large sign in the window of a store next to the church. The sign says, Speed Equipment Company. The next day, I checked it out, and sure enough, a man named Jack Harris had just opened a speed shop in my hometown. Shortly after we met and he learned of my interest in drag racing, he invited me to see what he was building in his home workshop. I was shocked to see a slingshot dragster, a concept where the driver sat behind the rear end, and it was well ahead of its time in 1954. Fitted with a flathead Ford engine and almost ready to race, he decided to change course and devote all his time to his racing parts business. Long story short, I inherited a race car and Jack went on to create the largest performance parts warehouse business in the United States. It was called Rush Sales. With the help of some students and a few shop teachers in my senior class at Lakewood High School, I made the parts needed to finish the car for my first drag race in Akron, Ohio. Shortly thereafter, it became obvious that the flathead Ford engine was becoming obsolete with the arrival of the newer overhead valve engines, particularly the Chrysler Hemi. In 1958, I built my first dragster chassis in the basement of my parents' home. But when it became obvious that the smoke filling the upstairs living room came from my welding, I got the boot. It was then I realized there was something wrong with my exit strategy for getting the chassis out of the basement. I had 12 steps up and an abrupt right turn into the kitchen. But that's where it got jammed. The roll cage wouldn't get past the door no matter how I turned it. My mother was very understanding. She said, as she watched me remove a large portion of the kitchen wall, Joseph, I didn't realize you were such a good carpenter, just like your patron saint. My dad, not so much. The increasing demand for my dragster frames justified renting a small shop. I called my new business Lakewood Chassis Company. My first real taste of power was the kick I got from the supercharged Chrysler. My home turf, Dragway 42, was often invaded by the likes of Gordon Collett and Connie Coletta with the same engine combination which made for some close competition. At the first NHRA Nationals in Indianapolis, I lined up against Tom McEwen. We both left the starting line with a perfectly matched pair of wheel stands for quite a distance down the strip. And then, as if it were choreographed, we set the wheels down exactly together. I was told the crowd went wild. I think that's when we both realized that we were not just drag racers, we were in the entertainment business. In Union Grove, Wisconsin, where I was already qualified with my gas dragster, top fuel contestant Art Malone asked me to make a run in his car so that he could watch how it left the starting line. 
Well, I did, and that's when the bug bit me. Back home, I immediately converted my engine to run on nitro, ending my status as a gas dragster. The flagman was still starting the races when nitro was reintroduced, and I felt for sure those flagmen had more guts than us drivers, standing so close in between those fuel cars. On the chassis building side of my business, I discovered new metal working technology that led me to develop a one-piece no-weld bell housing. Initially, I intended the hydroform aluminum housing to be exclusively for dragsters, but then we made a steel version and found it would contain all the shrapnel from cast iron flywheel explosions. That's when I knew we were on to something big because these grenade-like explosions caused primarily by factory showroom muscle cars were a regular occurrence every weekend at strips throughout the country. The factory-equipped iron flywheels and clutches were not adequate to be used in these high-revving engines. As a result, Many drivers and spectators were seriously injured and some killed. The late Wally Parks, founder of the NHRA, told me that Lakewood's containment method helped save drag racing back then because spectator claims had gone over the top and NHRA's track insurance was on the verge of being canceled. The huge need for our Lakewood housings demanded my prompt exit from competitive drag racing in 1965. Many years later, long after I sold the company, I was told that a survey conducted with the performance warehouses showed Lakewood scatter shields were number one in their sales category for over 50 years. As I look back, nothing has been as much fun as the time I spent in the seat of my top fuel dragster. I raced against hundreds of competitors in those nine years, many of whom still remain good friends. In my travels, I was overwhelmed by the hospitality shown me, and to pay back, I extended invitations to my race friends to be my guest at our Lakewood shop whenever they were in the Cleveland area. I didn't think they would all come at once, but they did. We had enough fuel dragsters in our parking lot to put on at least an eight-car top fuel show every weekend in the summer. Two popular photos taken outside our shop in 1964 show the stars of that era, like Tommy Ivo, Roland Leong, Marvin Schwartz, Jack Williams, Bob Sullivan, Jimmy Nix, Jerry Baltus, and Mike Snively, just to name a few. It was a repair station to many, but almost everyone agreed it was being part of a special group where all summer long was like Race Party Central. Today, I relive some of those great memories every time I fire up the engine in my vintage fuel dragster at what we call cackle fests. Thanks for watching and stay tuned to this site for more on the good old days and my future video interviews with the superstars of our sport.